Hello, everybody. We are here today to go over our 2021 recap and give you kind of our 2022 outlook. Luke is going to go through all the data points and the slides with you, but just wanted to let you know this is our first anniversary date of having a full year of our little um, webcasts for you. And I just wanted to say congratulations on a decent year. We've been through another COVID year. Yeehaw. And we're moving on to bigger, better things. Hopefully we can wrap COVID up in 2022. Um, we are taking a look hard at where we think we can have revenue moving forward in 2022, what our opportunities look like and what our threats look like. And Luke is now going to move through that with you. Thank you, Art. Yep. This is Luke McCarty. I'm going to go over some slides here with you guys um, for a recap and our outlook. So we're going to start first from the recap and kind of look at our performance over the last year. This also has our historical performance on there from the prior years. Um, this first slide here is gonna have our models that own individual stocks. Um, I highlighted our covered call strategy. That was our best performer. Um, once again, that is about 20 blue chip companies with covered calls written on top to enhance the dividend. So. It earned about 22% with a 5 to 7% dividend yield. That works great for income. Um, and then our equity income balanced from a risk-adjusted perspective almost doubled the benchmark. So this has some covered call strategies, has some real estate, has some high dividends. It also has some bonds in it. So as you know, we've been negative on bonds and bonds. most bonds have been negative for the last year. However, the bonds that we're utilizing in the equity income balanced model are high duration, or sorry, low duration, high yield. So um, when you think of that, they're high yield bonds that are typically more volatile in the market, but they're shorter duration. So what these, these bond managers do is they take high yield coupons with you know three to five years left in the coupon to get to par, and they put these into their portfolio so they are less sensitive to interest rate risk but you still receive the coupon. So we are very cautious about interest rates. The Fed's been saying interest rates are going to rise. Um, and they even said, you know, most recently three rate hikes next year. Um, you know, JP Morgan basically said they, they're thinking four rate hikes. So anywhere from two to four rate hikes is what we're seeing. Bonds will get hit again. Bonds will not perform well unless you own the right type of bond. Here is our models where this, it's mutual funds and ETFs only. You can see here our balanced 50 account did extremely well. So about a 10% return for a balanced account um, that has bond alternatives in it. I also highlighted our income models here too. Um, I should have highlighted our conservative 30. Let me talk there. So conservative 30 there, third from the bottom. Um, another steady year, 5.87%. If you look back in time, all the way back to 2007, this is the one that has not had a negative year. If you held for the full year, it has had negative gyrations in between the years. Um, and then multi-asset income and municipal income. Um, you rarely will you see me highlight something that earned 1%, but the benchmark, the bond index was down negative 1.77. So we more than doubled that index. Um, and the municipal income, right, we're closer to 3% and the index did one. So we've been able to maneuver through the bond market successfully over the last year. And you know we, we expect that to continue this year based on what we know about interest rates, the Fed is going to raise them, rates are going up, um, it's no longer uh, a projection, so they're, they're heading up. Um, economic indicators, we are all green right now. Um, from an economy standpoint, things look good, but from a, you know, Omicron, COVID standpoint, from a, um, you know, right, rising interest rates, is the Fed going to screw it up? You know, there's a lot to be cautious about out there. So we've actually reduced some risk in the portfolios. I'll talk about that next. But right now, the economy looks good from a standpoint of our indicators. Once again, if some of these start going negative, we reduce more risk. If they're all green, we should be risk on. But we have other factors outside of these indicators that we're worried about at the moment. Quarterly comparison. This chart is, is quite a bit on this page. But what we're looking at here is the change column. So. The dark number is our model. The, the grayish number is the benchmark. So if the far right, you can see the stock model um, underperformed a little bit for the year, but the Q4 it actually overperformed. So we're catching some headwinds there. 
our covered call strategy outperformed the benchmark by 3%. It did 11% in Q4, a big, big move. You know, and then equity income balance I mentioned before, you know, did about 5.6% in Q4, where the benchmark did about 2.6. So uh, if you have time to pause on this one, you can kind of see what's what's going on here. Um, you know, our conservative 30 um, did, you know, 3% change Q3 to Q4, where the benchmark did two. So we have, you know, most of our models are outperforming the benchmark, and, and that is our goal, while also having less risk than the benchmark. Oops, I skipped a slide. So inflation concerns. Here's one of our main concerns for the year. Um, this came out, this was the November number 6.9. Actually, last week, it came out at 7%. So we are seeing high inflation numbers um, from food, from energy, you know, your core CPI, head, headline CPI. There's a lot of um, discussion around inflation, and it, it probably is more than 7 Let's be honest. I mean, I'm, we're feeling more than 7 when you go to the grocery store, when you obviously when you get gas. Um, you're buying a car, your home. I mean, if we think of big ticket items, big purchases, um, inflation is higher than seven, but they measure it how they measure it. So we'll roll with their seven, 6.97% number. Um, here's the Fed and the interest rates. So this is the federal fund rate expectations. This is back to 2000. So what happens is the Fed has a projection of what they think interest rates will be by certain years and then their long run projection. Uh, right now, their long-run projection is about a two and a half Fed funds rate. However, the market expects the, lo the long run to be about 1.36. So usually the market is expecting the Fed to do less, either one way or the other. So we'll see how this dot plot is what they call it. We'll see how this plays out. But you can see rates are going up. Um, it looks like over the next year, maybe up about a percent. So that would be almost three to four rate hikes of a quarter of a percent to get us, you know, closer to the 1% range. So we'll see how that does, how the market reacts, but we have some things in place to help us in our portfolios to manage that interest rate risk from a stock perspective. And of course, as I mentioned, the bond perspective. Here's why we're concerned. So the Fed is behind the curve. So they're at the bottom in the red, right, is, is December of this last year. Uh, this chart is showing the federal funds rate with unemployment rate at 3.9%. Um, the Federal Reserve usually thinks of, the federal government in general thinks of full employment under 4%. So we are essentially at about full employment um, from this standpoint. And you can see what the effective federal funds rate is currently 0.08%. The CPI, right, inflation close to seven. So a real federal fund rate is negative 6.72. It has never been this far off with unemployment at 3.9% ever. Now, this can be a thought of, you know, gosh, is the Fed going to raise rates too fast? Are they going to mess it up? Or are they going to not raise rates fast enough? And this becomes a problem. Uh, the last time, you know, inflation was at over six was in 1970 the Fed funds rate was closer to nine. So it seemingly feels like we are behind the curve. We're behind the ball. We should have already been raising rates. Um, let's hope that inflation does not get out of control. But historically, we are way out of the way out of the normals here um, from unemployment to inflation and then the Fed funds rate. All right, asset class returns. This is a very choppy chart. There's going to be two of these, but if you, can, you can pause it if you want to. But the middle there where there's a line connecting is the asset allocation. So 2021, right, asset allocations did about 13%. Um, REITs were your top performer, you know, emerging markets were your low performer. You can see here, it is very difficult to predict what is going to be at the top of this chart. Um, and if you could predict it, right, REITs probably blew the most since 2007. If you go to the far right column where it says vol, volatility, REITs are the most volatile, you know, benchmark, the most volatile asset class that's on this chart. So the annualized number there next to the vol, the second to the right, which kind of shows you your annualized returns from 07 to 2021. Um, so our goal is to never be at the bottom and try to get to the bottom of the volatility on the far right. So with an asset allocation model, you're able to take away a lot of the volatility and be, almost be you know, third in line from cash to fixed income. So that's our goal is to keep, keep you, keep our clients, keep ourselves kind of in the middle here, keep us invested long-term. 
um, and not have to fight through big, big drawdowns. You know, if we go back to 2008, asset allocation was the biggest winner. Now it's still down 25%, but, you know, look at emerging markets equity, look at REITs, look at large caps. So if you're able to not lose as much on the downside and kind of reduce your volatility as an investor, our emotions won't take over and we will stay invested. Uh, that is our goal here with asset allocation is reduce risk and get a good return. Fixed income returns. Um, the 2021 column tips, treasury inflation protected securities. We own these in your portfolios if you own bonds in your portfolios. Um, the asset allocation average about negative. So uh, if you remember from our multi-asset income model, if you scroll back a little bit, we're up a little bit over 1%. Well, asset allocations, at, you know, zero or negative, you know, in your Barclays Ag, um, it's kind of your, your corporate bond index is negative one and a half. So you can see asset allocation here from an annualized perspective on the second to the far right, um, average five and a half percent. You know, the volatility is pretty low as well. We don't see bonds or fixed income averaging five and a half percent over the next two to three years. It's going to take a drop in interest rates to um, help the bond market, and they're already at zero, so that's going to be a difficult task. Um, as long as the Fed doesn't raise rates too fast, cut them, slash them, uh, we're going to have a we're going to have a problem with bonds, and I think we're going to be closer to the zero percent range in bonds for the next two to three years. All right, our Q4 portfolio changes. Some things we did: we reduced risk by eliminating small caps from the stock model, max growth, and our moderate models. Um, if the market is to take a big swoon or a big dive because of Omicron, small caps get hurt the most. Um, small caps that either lead on the upside or lead on the downside. So we took some of those out and added more to our hedging strategies. We did that um, before Thanksgiving and then before the end of the year, we did it again. Um, something we did in our stock model, we added Tesla, added Thermo Fisher. Uh, we removed PayPal and Disney. So we made some changes in Q4. Um, Tesla is going to be very volatile. You know, we've seen a lot of, I think it was Goldman Sachs came out and said, you know, their price targets $1,200. Um, by the end of the year, we, we think it's higher than that. So Tesla's having record numbers and their actual PE ratio, their price to earnings ratio is going down. Um, currently, of the stocks that we analyze, <clears throat> Tesla and Google are the only two companies that have a lowering PE ratio as the price of the stock is rising. That means their earnings are outpacing the price of the stock. So it just means the stock is inherently getting cheaper over time. And they're just really strong companies right now. Um, Q4 review. Our covered call strategy had the largest growth in Q4 of over 11%. You know, this strategy consists of 20 blue chip companies with a tactical covered call strategy. Uh, last year, it did about a 5% dividend in call premium. The, 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 the goal is 5 to 7%, uh, but in a low interest rate environment, you know, 5% is, is still really good. Um, equity income balanced is our best performer from a risk adjusted return. I mentioned this, it's a 50, 50 model, 50 stock, 50 bonds with a 13 plus percent return for the year. Um, it has been very difficult to get returns in bonds. Only certain sectors of bonds are working from your, your tips, your treasury inflation protected and your high yield short duration for the bonds that were working last year. All right, 2022 changes. We've already started making some changes to the portfolio this year. Uh, we reduced our emerging market exposure in our stock model, and we added Chevron. So we see oil and energy um, as another big year. Um, the, the disparity between energy stocks and S&P 500 stocks is, you know, is very large. Historically, they're, they're far separated. You know, there's a couple things we track where, you know, what the price of these oil companies should be based on the price of oil. And they're just not there as we see oil continuing to rise. Um, we have some new tax efficient strategies for taxable accounts. So those that are high income earners that have taxable money, um, we have basically a way to take the S and P 500 from a, from a standpoint of sectors and buying and selling those sectors and actually capturing losses on the way up. Um, let me know if you have questions on that um, and we'll be reaching out to our clients that we see this fit for. Uh, we're also removing momentum. So momentum was kind of one of our darlings of the last 10 years, meaning, you know, buy high, sell higher. It's kind of momentum. And we're adding in uh, PALC. 
So it's a pacer large cap um, multi-factor momentum rotation. Essentially what it does, momentum, MTUM, your ETF, does a six-month rebalance. PALC does very similar, but it's monthly. So we see the markets are rotating faster um, from a standpoint of, you know, is it the travel sector? You know, is it the energy sector? Is it banks, right? Is it tech? Um, is it your cyclicals, industrials, things like that? So if we can get something that helps rebalance on a monthly basis, tax efficiently inside an ETF, um, we're making that change across the board. Our 2022 outlook, uh, inflation concerns, right? Will the Fed raise rates too fast? The Fed raised rates too fast in 2018, and then they stopped and cut them. So you don't want to see big movements in interest rates, you know, or will they not raise them fast enough? So I think they're, they're cautious of what happened in 2018. So I think they're going to take a slower approach to raising rates, but it still needs to bring down inflation. We cannot have 7% inflation for the, all of next year. So we're going to see rates rise and we'll see how inflation is impacted. Um, and then historically during midterm years, the first half of the year is slow, uh, followed by a strong second half. And I say that's based on, you know, who owns, you know, the Senate, Congress, president from a political standpoint right, right now, there's no, there's no gridlock. Um, it's the Democrats across the board. So what the markets look for is gridlock. So it would be good for the markets, politics aside, if the Republicans take over, you know, the House or the Senate, because then there's more gridlock and there's less, uh, there's less unknowns, right? There's less unknowns about tax changes, less unknowns about policies, um, because, you know, there'll be gridlock. And, you know, sometimes when the government doesn't do anything, it is better for the stock market. Uh, 2022, we're also going to continue with our bond alternatives. So bonds were negative last year. Bonds, I think, will be negative this year. They'll be flat. So there, there's a long road ahead for bonds that have historically done 5 or 6%. Uh, we don't see that anymore. So for bond alternatives, we're going to use annuities, you know, fixed indexed annuities. We're going to use preferred stocks, right? Take your five and a half, six percent coupon, um, institutional real estate. Uh, this is we're, we're taking a deeper dive to see if we're going to you know, model this across all our portfolios or most of our portfolios is a bond alternative. Um, but it's institutional real estate um, hedging. You have some of this in your portfolio from Swan. Right, Swan is 90% treasuries, 10% forward S&P options. Um, JHEQX, that is your JP Morgan hedged equity. That is the S&P 500 with puts on the downside. So it helps your downside. And then our short duration high yield bonds um, from mainstay to prudential. This is the only bond market we see with the potential positive. Um, you know, get a high enough coupon to offset potentially a flat price in the bond. So get a four or five coupon, bond stays flat, you still made four or five. So we're looking at all these in the portfolios. We're making some changes already. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor your risk. So let us know uh, what questions you have. Contact us, contact me, Luke McCarty, contact Art, um, call our office. Um, and thank you for listening. Let us know what questions you have and, and how we can help.